All right. So divisibility is we we can add, we can multiply, we can subtract. There is no such thing as division. There is does it divides, which is a question. Once we had divides, we introduced a new type of sameness, which is the idea of a congruency. And if we looked at these, say properties of A is congruent to B, this idea, we have a new type of same. It's like a triple line, kind of like a same as. Um, these two are the same. Underneath modulo M, uh, I would rather for me, for my notation, makes it easier to write. I also, not only does it make it easier to write it, it personally I think it simply looks better. I'm saying A and B are congruent to one another. They're the same thing according to if I take the modulus, what do I get? And there's three things that happen. We have the definition. So the first thing is simply the definition. The definition is that M divides A minus B. What that means is that if you take A minus B, take two numbers and subtract it, there's some multiple of M apart. Uh, Theorem-wise, we have two theorems that are based upon this. And these are all logically equivalent. So it's logically equivalent to if I would take A, ask what the remainder is after I divide by M, take B, ask what the remainder is when I divide by M. If they have the same remainders, I'll call them congruent. And the third is that these are equal to each other within some sort of multiple of M apart. These all mean the same thing, and so however you want to say it, it's one of those features of, like when I taught number theory, not number theory, but when I did linear algebra and you write one thing down, everything that comes into play, when you write this one thing down, the entire branch of what you're supposed to know about it has to come to mind. So if I do write that, what should come to mind is all three of those things at the same time. You should be able to describe what does it mean to be congruent. What it means to be congruent under modulo M means that, you know what, if I subtracted them, there's some sort of multiple of M. On the other hand, if I took the remainder after I divided by M, I would get the same number. On the other hand, it also means that they're equal with so many M steps away. So you would sit there and go through it. All three things happen at the exact same time. They mean the same thing. And so, sometimes you'll pick your favorite. So if we talk about congruency, and I ask, oh, here's a congruence problem you're going to have to work with. Maybe you're going to pick one in particular. Maybe you'll use your favorite version. But all three have to be coming into mind as you do it. So now that we have congruencies, one of the nice features of this sameness, what are some properties of it? It allows us to you know, work as, at a congruent problem. And so if you're given that A and B are the same under congruence M, on the other hand, you have found that two other numbers, C and D, are congruent under M. So if I said congruent 5, under, <coughs> under modulo 5, 2 would be the same as what numbers? Give me some positive numbers that 2 is congruent to under modulo 5. 7, 12, what are you doing? Adding You're adding 5. Give me some negatives. 2 is congruent to what? Negative 3 and? Negative 8. We're taking away 5. They're 5 apart, right? And so we're saying things like, okay, so 2 and 7. So for example, you could tell me that 2 under modulo 5 would be congruent to 7, but under modulo 5 that would be congruent to minus 3. I mean, there's lots of these, right? The entire infinite number of them. Uh, four under five. Give me one positive. That's not nine. Say 14. Um, give me a negative number that is not negative one. Say negative six, right? And so there's, a, there's an infinite number of these things. And see, these are all the same. Now, one of the things that you could ask yourself is if you had problems like so 4 and negative 6 are the same. They're congruent under modulo 5. It's a new type of sameness, congruence. In algebra problems, if you would have something like, I wonder what number would be congruent 
under, say, 5 to 3. Right? This is probably rather easy to solve. You could have 3, but what else could you have? 8 and negative 2, right? All those, all those numbers that you could ever possibly want, right? What would happen, on the other hand, is that's easy to see. I would say 3 and then plus minus 5 after that. On the other hand, what if I would say that this isn't simply an x? What if I would take this thing and say, well, what if it was x plus 2? And I'd like to get rid of the 2. And so we would do things like, okay, what is the inverse? And, you know, what things make zeros, right? And so one of the things is I'd like a zero on my left. And let's say I'm, I'm not going to allow you to subtract. Let's say there was no such thing as subtraction. Say, well, I'm just going to take away two. Oh, yeah, you could. Well, let's say I'm, I'm mean and I say you're not allowed to do a negative. I want x plus zero. That's what I want. But what is the same as zero? Under mod five. Five and ten and fifteen. Those are all zeros, right? So what could I do to the left to get a zero? I could add three, which makes it five, and five is the same as zero. So if I wanted to, I can, oh, I, I can simply add three to both sides. I'm going to add three here. I'm going to add three here. Now I'd have x plus five is congruent under five to six, but that's really just simply x because that is actually that thing is the same as zero. So I can just get rid of it. But that's congruent under 5 to 6. But what, what is 6 congruent to? I don't like 6 is too big. What is that congruent to? What's a smaller number than 6 that it's the same as? 1. And so that would be my answer. 1. So we can do all this sort of stuff. The question is, what can you do to congruencies so that you don't change it? We have inverses. We have identities, etc. But if we're interested in getting rid of these particular things, and so it's like, all right, what do I do? So what we could do with these particular problems, like algebraic in nature, if you're interested in doing lots of algebra, algebra problems, take a number theory course. Our first level number theory course is a 600 level course. So please understand that means it's non-trivial. Right? That's definitely a book. When I had to fill in once and it was like just to prepare for the lecture, I had the book and I took that book and you have things like line, line, this becomes this, and you're like looking at that, it's like, yeah, that's not obvious, so I grabbed a piece of paper, and it was a good two sheets worth of arithmetic to go between two lines, right? It took me about three hours to prepare for an hour some lecture, and students were like, well, can't I just read the book? And the answer is, of course not. <laughs> you definitely have to sit there and do it, and it's going to take you some time. I mean, that's what you expect at five, six hundred level courses. Anyways, so what are the things that we can do? If we're given this, what we could do is say that, well, one, is if, you're, if you tell me that A and B are the same thing, what can I do so the congruency doesn't change? Well, I could add C. A lot of times we'll, we'll just add C to both sides. Well, not only can you add C to both sides, you could add, really, anything that's the same to both sides. Right? So what would that tell us? That tells us, oh, look, 2 and 7 are the same, right? So if I wanted to, what could I add to the left-hand side? Well, if, what, if I added 4 to the left-hand side, that would be the same thing as doing what? If I wanted to, it would be the same as adding 14. It would be the same thing as adding the negative 6. Right? What does it tell us? You can put the addition of the same thing, except now the same thing under normal arithmetic what is the only thing that's the same, that's equal to 3? Three? 3, so we would add 3 to both sides. But under congruency, do you have, what's the same as 3? Under mod 5, 8, and 13. It's like, so I could actually do whatever I want to both, yeah, as long as they are congruent. You no longer have a single thing that you can do, but an infinite number of things, all of which will not change your answer. Not only can you add the same thing, you can multiply the same thing. And your congruency will not change.
Now, normally these are done in algebraic problems, right? You would normally do things like, you know, okay. um, let me see here. Say, example, why would we do something like, things like this? So let's say that we have 3x is congruent under 2 to 4. We can play around a little bit here. Now, one of the things we could do here uh, is it sure would be nice if x was by itself. All right, but for x to be by itself, it needs to actually be multiplied by what? By does a third exist under number theory? Nope. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense. So what must it be multiplied by? It must be multiplied to have x alone. X it would have been nice if it was x alone, but x alone is x times one. But what is one? Under modulo two, it's actually anybody three, which under modulo two is five, and we could keep going to seven, right? And we could go on forever. So I multiply it by three, but three is the same as one, so this is actually one times x under two to four, so x is congruent under two to four. But what is four congruent to? Zero, but that's just congruent under two to zero, and so x is congruent to two to zero. Now, does this have a single answer? No, because what are the things that are congruent under 2 to 0? If you had a single name for it, what would it be? 2, 4, 6, 8, evens, right? In 0 and negative 2, all multiples of 2, right? So it doesn't have a answer, it has an infinite number of answers. But why do I just simply say 0? Well, it's, it's the main representative, right? It's the smallest of the non-negatives. Now, when you look at this, 3x is congruent under 2 to 4, would you see that all x is just all the evens? Yeah, that didn't jump out at me. But what did we do? We have to work, we have to pick numbers, replace them what, what, with what they're the same as, have particular goals as we go through it. Solving modular problems like this is an entire class of things, but we're, that'll be in one of the sections that we actually skip. But if you're interested in doing problems of this nature, it's kind of fun. But they all come down to what are we allowed to do? Add by like things, multiply by like things. Like things are far more complicated than just simply equal. Oh, well, we can add both sides by three. We can multiply both sides by three. No, you can actually add and multiply by an infinite number of things as long as they meet the congruency. You just have to know what the class is. You should be able to do problems like this and be able to go both through that a little ellipsis. When you see a number, you should be able to fill out its entire class in your head. Say, oh, oh, you said three, but are congruent four, this is what you're really telling me. You're telling me three, seven, 11, negative one, negative five, right? All of those numbers are three under modulo four. Under modulo two, we get those numbers, which is all the odds, plus and minus. Okay. So what else can we do? Well, we can add and multiply, but there's an immediate corollary to this, an application of it. We're replacing things with their equals. It really, not only can we get to here, any one of these objects, if we're solving it, can be, you know, like three is the same as one under modulo two, right? You can always replace something with what it's congruent to. You can replace things with their congruency. That's one application. Another application is if I'm interested in modular arithmetic, if I would say, you know what, let's add two numbers and then ask what the modulus is. If it's true that you can replace a number by what it's congruent to, and congruency uh, is the same thing as same remainder, what this allows you to do is to make your problem easier by replace A with its remainder replace B 
with its remainder and then find the remainder. Since A is the same as any of its congruency, what we can do is just simply go through this and just simply go and say A, take A mod M, take B mod M. What's nice about this is modulus M is a remainder. The remainder will spit out 0, 1, up to M minus 1. It's small. So what if A is large and B is large? If I say large number plus large number, it's an even bigger number, and I ask what's the modulus, that's hard to figure out. But on the other hand, it says, well, don't do it in that order. Make A small, make B small, add those smaller numbers, <coughs> and then find the remainder. It's the same thing. We can replace things with their congruent. And so one is that. It's more important, much more powerful, underneath multiplication. Why is that nice? Well, a, if A is a big number and B is a big number and you multiply big numbers, that's a really big number. And finding the modulus is, let's put it this way, mod 11, right, is going to spit out how many numbers? 11, right? 0 to 10. But if A is a million and B is a million, and then I take a million times a million, how many zeros do we got? A million millions is a trillion. Would you like to take the modulus of a trillion? It's like, well, that's a lot. Wouldn't it be easier to rather take the modulus of a million and the modulus of a million and you replace this million down to a number between 0 and 10? And a number between 0 and 10. So the worst that a million times a million under mod m, if you did the modulus first, would be 100. And then mod 11, sorry. Boy, that's a lot easier. Make the problem easier. Go from big numbers to small numbers before you do your operations. That's what this tells you to do. If you're, if you're interested in taking modulus, take the modulus of everything that you see you know, in terms of a, a term plus or factors times. Simplify all those. Multiply them, and you can always keep taking the modulus as often as you want. If it, oh, look, this times this got bigger than my modulus. Let's make it smaller. Replace it with what it is. Keep going down. Stay with small numbers. <coughs>